a reading from Second Peter chapter 3 and beginning at verse 1. So Peter writes, Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and, command, and the command given by our Lord and Saviour through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will, scum, will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved by fire, being kept for the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Amen. <clears throat> May I speak and may we listen in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We hear lots of stories these days involving non-believers scoffing, as our reading said, at Christians, about their attendance at church every Sunday, about their helping others, giving to charity, helping at food banks, about caring about other people instead of just walking away as they do. I think you may agree that by far the worst scenario is when the clever ones, the intellectuals if you like, who read a little and scoff a lot at the words and the promises of scripture which appear not to have come true. The return of Jesus as he promised following his death, his resurrection and his ascension into heaven is one well, of such apparent major promise still awaiting fulfilment. So I thought this week's reading was about a wonderful opportunity to explore exactly what was said or promised over 2,000 years ago, and if that is even possible, we will sort it out. You all know me, you know my abilities, you know my failings. I've never claimed to be a biblical scholar, but I hope that my efforts at researching may have been of help either now or in the future to you all. I'll tell you a story first about the late Bishop Stephen Neal, who spent some time early in his life as a missionary teacher in India. Once he suspected that the class he was teaching were cheating. The boys were not so good at the subject of being copied off the work of those who were better. And one or two of the very able pupils had their work used directly or indirectly by almost the whole class. So Neil's solution was to study the scriptures carefully. Nobody had got all the answers right. But in the process of copying from one another, some of the boys had introduced new mistakes of their own, which they copied by other pupils further down the line. And Neil was able by studying where the mistakes occurred, to draw a chart of exactly who had copied from whom. The class were absolutely dumbfounded. They accused him of witchcraft. They said it was as though he was secretly present, watching them while they did their homework, copying off everybody else's books. But he hadn't. All he'd done was apply logic, and the answers were discovered. And Bishop Neal himself used the illustration to explain that in the early church mistakes were introduced into the text of the New Testament. Even in printed books, mistakes creep in. 
I'm sure you've heard the expression that all of scripture is God breathed. That it's God breathed into man who then transcribes it into words. But there's also a saying that says man makes plans and God laughs because man always gets it wrong. So, mistakes will creep in. I don't think any of us have read a book of any description about anything without finding a mistake somewhere in it. Cindy always reads books, finds the mistakes and puts a circle around them all. So, I don't know what she's going to do with it afterwards, but they're all there. In the days before printing, books were copied entirely by hand and it took a long time to copy out. Even, as we know, even copy typing is boring, but using handwriting is even more so. How easy for the eye to slip from one word to a similar one on the next line. Forget that you slip down a line and just carry on. Or go back and repeat a line or a word. How many times have you been reading a book and a member of the family starts talking and you read the line again? And then something else happens and you read the line again and so on. It all creeps into it. How easy is it when the text says something that seems very strange to you who's copying it to decide that you'll correct it for the person who wrote it? And that deliberately, by saying surely thinks the copyist, they can't have meant that. There must be a mistake. I better put it right. So he put something else down instead. Or purely accidentally, producing a smoother sentence that's easier to read. Or dangerous is a smoother idea which bears no relation to the original. The trouble is, of course, as we know, that the New Testament regularly says things which don't fit neatly into the world view of the day, and certainly now. And it doesn't always read easily either. For this reason, people like Bishop Neal and students of the text are alert to the possibility that there might be corruption or distortion of the words, because we have so many manuscripts of the New Testament dating from early 2nd century onwards, far, far more manuscripts exist for the New Testament than for any other ancient book ever. And we can usually tell where mistakes have happened. Because like the schoolboys copying from one another, we can track variations across different documents. In almost every case, we can be reasonably certain that we know what the author wrote, what he meant. In almost all cases, the variations are so small that the sense of the passage is not altered, not seriously anyway. If, for instance, the words for and, and but, and the, were to drop out of the text or be wrongly included, it wouldn't normally make much difference. But just once or twice, and you can have guessed that this is one of those times, it makes an enormous difference. Here at the end of our passage that we heard earlier, we have a statement which, in older translations of the Bible, came out one way, which, with all biblical manuscripts, sorry, biblical manuscripts we now have, almost certainly needs to be changed. In the older versions, the passage ends with a warning that the earth and all the works on it will be burned up. A cosmic destruction, the end of the physical world, is that really what Peter wrote? If so, if he did write that, it's the only place in the whole of early Christian literature that such an idea was had. So it would appear to scholars that that was not what he meant or what he meant to say. But in some manuscripts in the Old Testament, including two of the very best we've got, the word for will be burned up simply isn't there. Instead, there's a word that means will be found or will be discovered or will be disclosed, perhaps even will be found out will be another way of getting to the meaning. What scholars believe has happened is this. Several early scribes sitting down facing copying these documents and 
found, will be found, thought to themselves, well that can't be right, doesn't make any sense, surely he meant will be burnt up. So they changed it. You can see that this causes confusion because there are several other manuscripts that they try out different options. Let's try this word or that word or this idea or that idea and look at the difference it makes. As with the rest of the New Testament, Peter is not saying that the present world of space, time and matter is going to burn up and be destroyed. That's more like the view of ancient Stoicism, and certainly some modern people think that's true. What will happen, as many early Christian teachers said, is that some sort of fire, either real or metaphorical, will come upon the whole earth, not to destroy, but to test everything out and to purify it by burning up everything that doesn't meet the test, God's test, if you like. You may remember hearing about the refiner's fire, where gold is refined by heat. It's the same idea. So it doesn't burn away, it just changes. So the elements that will be dissolved are probably the parts of creation that are needed at the moment, the light and heat, that is the soul. And the moon. If you read Revelation 21, they will not be needed in the new creation, the moon or the sun. But Peter's concern throughout this letter is that with the judgment of humans for what they've done wrong, not with its non human part of the cosmos for their own sake. So the day will come then when all will be revealed and all will be judged. With fire. This is the promise which Peter re emphasizes here throughout his letter and throughout his previous letter against those who said, or at or soon after the end of the first Christian generation, that the whole thing must be a mistake since Jesus had not, after all, returned. But just think about it. They, as you know, expected that Jesus would rack a few days, maybe a couple of weeks, but he'd certainly be back. And today, 2,000 years later, we're still waiting. Many in our own, in our own day have added their voices to those of these deceivers in verse 3, saying that the early Christians all expected Jesus to return at once. And since he didn't, we must therefore set aside great parts of his teaching, because being based on a mistake, they must have all come out wrong. So they want you to give up your belief of everything because Jesus hasn't come back. But this merely repeats the mistake against which Peter is warning, and in fact, this is the only passage in first century Christian literature which directly addresses the question of a delay. It doesn't seem to have bothered Christian writers in the second century but it seems to bother people today. They continue to teach that the Lord would return, and that this might happen at any time. If you remember, we talked about he might come like a thief in the night, quietly, picking up an image of Jesus that he applied to himself during his earthly ministry. The misunderstanding of both ancient and modern seems to have come about partly because at any time could equally mean Therefore, perhaps that today or tomorrow he might come, or partly because there really are some things that Jesus did say that they chose to leave out. In Mark 13 and elsewhere, it's thought that it would happen within a generation. But what he was talking about in the generation were the events concerning the destruction of Jerusalem and the Jerusalem Temple, which did indeed happen within a generation of Jesus' day in AD 70, to be precise. So about 40 years after Jesus died, the place was destroyed. But well, Peter warns as Jewish teachers have done before him, and will do again, that God doesn't work to our time scales. If you read Psalm 19 verse 4, it puts it so well, as did our song today, a thousand years in God's sight is like a single day. And vice versa. You can't stick God into a box and say, you will obey our laws of time. You can't do it. The point
point here is, which is developed in the final section of this letter, which will be next week and the week after, is about patience. We're not very good at patience, are we? Always waiting, pushing all the time. This virtue, as can often be seen, was emphasized by many early Christian writers, partly because patience was always necessary in any ordinary human relationship, and partly because it was for some of them quite a new idea. In the ancient pagan world, patience was not seen as a virtue. We now say patience is a virtue, but not many people have it. But here it's evaluating in an entirely different way. It's escalated to an entirely different level. Patience we practice in day-to-day -day relationships with one another has got to be translated into a cosmic scale because God will indeed bring upon the whole world the day of the Lord when Jesus returns, the day when we will all be just, all will be revealed, but he will do it, not in our time, but in his time. And it could be tomorrow or the day after. So it doesn't mean that while we're waiting, we simply sit around twiddling our thumbs. We are impatient. What appears to us when we are being impatient is God's delay is in fact God's moment of fresh vocation. It gives us time to do what he wants, basically. There are tasks to do in the meantime. But that takes us into the next and final section of the letter, which is not for today, but next week and the week after. Amen. Amen.